All right, welcome back to the afternoon session. This will be the last uh, session of the day. We'll have uh, two general session talks and then three lightning talks. Uh, to start us off, we have a mini submarine cable track uh, with Alistair Wilkie from Hibernia, Elena Badiola from Telefonica. Uh, we'll be learning a bit about the technology, installation, maintenance, politics, uh, regulatory, and other things. Uh, we're going to have both talks go and then have Q&A at the end. Uh, and the presenters have said they'll take questions about anything relating to submarine cables, uh, whether or not it's part of the presentation. So without any further ado, Alistair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alistair Wilkie from Hibernia Networks. Uh, we just a, as a sort of introduction, I've worked on submarine cables probably for the last 25 years. Um, UK Belgium 5 was the first cable I worked on, which was the first uh, international optical cable that was put in. And since then, I've worked on the design, development, installation, manufacturing, and commissioning, and now predominantly maintenance of submarine cables, and obviously maintaining the submarine cables for Hibernia Networks. In addition to the maintenance for Hibernia, I'm also the chairman of the Atlantic Cable Maintenance Authority, and we look after about 50% of the submarine cables in the Atlantic region for maintenance. So these photographs are just some interesting photographs of submarine cables and other issues that we have. And the final one that's coming up uh, shortly is a interesting projection of the world by a guy called Buckmeister, Buckmeister Fuller projection. And it shows the land as a single connected piece, but actually quite a nice way of showing the world. What I'm going to talk about, and Elena will fill in the bits that I don't do, basically, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of submarine cables um, and what the position is today. Um, then, more importantly, I'm going to go forward and talk a little bit about the le legal aspects of cables, um, put a simulated cable between the UK and the US in, and show the differences in the UK and the US legal regimes for putting a cable in. And then I'll, I'll touch on the maintenance at the end, and Elena will talk much more about SAM1 and the Telefonica cable. So Atlantic, that's what the Atlantic looked like in the late 1940s. Those are the telegraph cables. There's bits in the middle missing because they've either been recovered or they didn't have the data. But that's the routing of the uh, telegraph cables, um, predominantly the shortest route, Ireland to Newfoundland and the UK to America eventually. Um, the other route, obviously, via uh, the Azores, again, the shortest route to the States. In the 19 50s through to the 1970s, those are the uh, cables that were put in for the analog era, fairly low channel count cables, but again, taken over predominantly by satellite by this stage. And then we had the boom in the 1990s to the 2000s, we've got the optical cables. Different routings now. We've now gone for the longer routes, which means you're taking more into the deep water, which is cheaper cable and more reliable. Shallow water cables are the ones that get damaged more frequently. And as you see, Newfoundland's not connected. Now, I've, I've missed out the Greenland Connect cable from Iceland to Greenland and Greenland down to Newfoundland. But there's actually very few cables going into Canada. So you put them all together, it looks a bit of a mess. Um, but bearing in mind, each cable is probably less than one inch in diameter. So it's actually not taking up an awful lot of real estate on the seabed. But it's very obvious that the fiber optic cables are mimicking a lot of the telegraph routes rather than the, the analog routes. That's a map of the world today um, as of March. That's all the uh, fiber optic cables put in. And the ones in blue are Hibernia's, including the new uh, Express that's going to be going in at the back end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, some, some parts of the world aren't very well connected. South Africa, uh, fairly poorly connected, parts of South America, um, Australasia. But the major routes are all there. And there's going to be some interesting new routes being put in. There's a proposal for a cable from Japan across to the UK, going across the Northwest Passage, which will reduce the latency by quite a significant amount from, across the, from Japan to the Europe. And that's Arctic fiber, possibly going to go in in 2016, 2017. Finances, as ever, is going to be the main problem for that one. So. 
I'm uh, talking about submarine cables and the um, legal aspects. 1884, we brought out the first uh, legal regime to protect submarine cables. Um, majority of the sort of European countries plus the US and the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth, signed the agreement. And basically it says cables must be allowed to be laid as and when you want. And if you damage a cable, you're liable unless you're saving a life at sea. So we think, well, that's 1884, that's pretty good. 1958, another one came in, the Convention of the High Seas and the Continental Shelf, which defined the high seas and defined the Continental Shelf. And it has four basic freedoms of the high seas. One is flying, you can fly over the high sea, you can fish in the high seas, you can lay submarine cables and pipelines in the high seas, and you can sail on the high seas, and no country can limit that. So that was done in 58, but bearing in mind the 1884 Act is still valid. And then we got to the Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS in 1982, ratified by almost all coastal states. Two major coastal states are missing. One is the United States and the other one is Israel. Um, North Korea as well, but I, I won't say that's a major coastal state. So the issue really is that America uh, and the US, we need to get it ratified because that will actually allow cables to be put into the US in a more easy fashion. It does require though that you put a legislation, local national legislation in place to enact UNCLOS. And this is one of the issues that most countries, apart from a few, have not put national legislation in place. And the ones that have are Australia, New Zealand, Uruguay, Colombia, and that is about it. Most of them still are relying on the 1884 Act. So in the UK, the issues with uh, cutting a cable, the fine is £3,000, $5,000. So most people just walk, walk away from it, don't care. It's not enough. Um, certain countries, uh, it's much higher. In New Zealand, it's $400,000. And that's a, an amount of money that somebody is actually going to stop. So that's the uh, legal regimes in place at the moment. Um, There's a not a particularly clear map to read, but uh, the presentation will be available online afterwards. And this is the jurisdictions and how they all sit. You've got the high seas, you've got the continental shelf, and then you've got the territorial waters within 12 miles. There's also a three mile limit, which is used in the United States for the state itself, as opposed to the federal jurisdiction. And then there are, there's a contiguous zone, which is 24 miles, which is not used very often, but it is a, it's part of the UNCLOS regime. So what I'd like to do now is go through what to do with how you evolve a cable system from start to finish. So my system is going to be from Breen in the UK, near Som in Somerset. It's the landing point for PTAT. It's also the landing point for the two of the Tata cables. Across to Lynn, which is the landing point in, near Boston for our cable that uh, we have from Halifax to Lynn. And the easiest way to do it is to draw a straight line. Unfortunately, you go through parts of Southern Ireland, middle of Newfoundland, and down the Bay of Fundy, so places that you don't really want to put cables. So the next iteration is actually quite simple. You just go into deep water as quickly as possible. Um, and using Google Earth as a tool has simplified this tremendously. So you go from Breen down into deep water, across round the Grand Banks, and up into Boston. So that's the basic route that you send off to a company to do a desktop study. So they look at it and they then work out what they've got to do with the, uh, the route and they modify it slightly. They make sure there's no other cables in the way. They make sure they are crossing pipelines at the right angle. They make sure that you're, doing, that you're not going through environmentally sensitive areas, which on most land-based projects, you are going to be going through some very sensitive areas. And in shallow water, there are lots of marine protected areas, marine conservation zones, special areas of conservation. They all have lots of different names, but they're all basically the same, same thing. You must then look at difficult areas for doing the installation. You don't want to go through hard, rocky seabed. And they do all this, and they do this. Uh, they visit the sites. They make sure that the landlords who are going to be there are happy with you. And then they come up with a, a design, which is the end of your desktop study design and it's a new design for the cable which can go and be surveyed. One of the important parts that they do come up with in the desktop study is a list of the permits, way leaves and licenses that you'll require to put the cable in. The, there are three different types of permits. The main one is the operating license, which is for the owner, um, AT&T's, the 
our Hibernian networks. We have operating licenses for each of the countries we operate in. And that's our, it's our responsibility to have that. And without that, you can't actually run the cable. You then have the permits and principle, which again are the cable owner's responsibility. And they are the ones to allow the cable to be put in situ for the rest of its life. The lifetime of the cable is normally 25 years. That's the design life. Current cable technology is sort of overtaking that, and they last for about 10 to 12 years, unless they're um, in a route that is not heavily used. Unrepeated systems, on the other hand, can last 30 years plus, because they can just be expanded. The final permit to the operational permits, and they'll be the operator, the ship, cable ship supplier, and we'll provide those permits for running the ship at sea. So if we go back to our cable between the UK and the US, you've got two different lots of permits to get. So from the land to the high water mark, you'll be on either local landlords and in both countries, uh, it's commonly the local authority, but it might be private, private beach you're going on to. From the high water mark to the low water mark in the US, it's public ownership, and so it's normally owned by the city. In the UK, it's either the landlord or the Crown Estate, and the Crown Estate run um, the estate for the Queen on her behalf. The, from low water mark to three mile limit in the States, it's the State and the Army Corps of Engineers you need a permit from. Uh, in the UK, it's the Crown Estate who own the land and the Marine Management Organization who are the ones that you get the license from. Again, three to 12 miles, going slightly further out to sea. It's a federal license in the States. And again, the Crown Estate and the Marine Management Organization in the UK. Beyond 12 miles in the UK, there are no, no requirements. You can put a cable in wherever you like. There's no legal requirement to have a license. You have to inform the government that you're putting the cable there, but there's no, nothing else. In the US, the same. However, national marine sanctuaries, you have to get a permit from NOAA. And since this cable is going to be going into Lynn, there's a Stellwagen Bank national marine sanctuary just outside Lynn, which will be crossing through. So that will need a permit. These permits take time, and it's, uh, if you look at the permit for the UK, the Crown Estate, you have a, a lease because they're the landlord, uh, the Marine Management Organization, the license to put the cable in. You have a local authority for the beach, and that would be a way leave to cross the land. And it can take between three to six months. So it's not insubstantial amount of time. During that time, though, the cable can be manufactured, so that's less of a risk. In the US, coming into Lynn, uh, when we put our original cable in, we had a total of 11 permits. And nowadays, due to the main environmental permitting in the United States, it is a very, very slow process. Um, 12 to 15 months is pretty good. I have heard of them getting longer than that. Um, the issues are really compounded by the arguments and the discussions when the Army Corps of Engineers will say they won't give you a license until the state has given you a license. And the state say they won't give you a license until the ACOE have given you the license. So the two just don't work together. And it is a very slow process. So, but once you've got the permits in and you've got all your working done, you can then finish the job. So you do the desktop study first. You build your cable station. And this is our cable station in Southport in the UK. You do your survey of the seabed. You manufacture the cable. This is taken from the Greenwich site in uh, London when they manufacture cable there. It's quite old. You do the shore end, uh, it's floated in on large floats called pebbles, and then the divers cut the floats off and let the cable come ashore. You might armor the cable. This is our cast iron articulated piping that we put round cables on beaches which are particularly rocky. Um, you would normally try and bury it as well, but it does protect the cable very well. You then plow the rest of the cable in. This is a three meter deep water uh, plow. I say deep water, it goes down to about 1500 meters water depth. And we can plow the cable into about a depth of a meet, just over a meter in most seabeds. This one will go to three meters in shallow, in sea, soft seabeds. Um, we don't normally like going that deep unless there's an anchor risk, mainly because if you bury the cable that deep, it's very difficult to bring it back up. And then uh, after the cable has been installed, you might have to go back and do some uh, inspection with an ROV. And uh, that you'd normally inspect about 1% or 2% of the buried cable, depending on how well buried it is. And finally, you do some tests, and you have a system. 
So maintaining the system afterwards is one of the issues. There are two different types of maintenance zones. These are the uh, what we call the zone ones, ACMA, the Atlantic one, of which I chair, Siokma, Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean, Yokohama, uh, just sits off, off Japan, and NAS, North America zone, looks after the west, west coast of the states. MECMA looks after the Indi uh, Mediterranean. And these are done on a collaborative basis. ACMA has about 60 members, three ships, one based in Curaçao, one in Portland, UK, and one in Brest in France. And the one in Portland in the UK goes across to Bermuda for six months of the year as well. So it splits its obligations. And we cover the areas of the, the whole of the Atlantic. You notice we also cover the southwest um, of South America as well, which is anachronistic, but we don't touch wood. We haven't had to go down and repair down there. The private maintenance agreements are very similar, uh, similar zones for obvious reasons. They're just, they're just competing with each other. Uh, again, APMA is the private maintenance agreement in the Atlantic. It has about, has three ships as well, Curaçao, Cap Verde, and Cali, um, and covers a similar, num similar area and a similar number of cables. Um, so there's the, the two are competing with each other, so we do have a healthy competition there. So that, this is a picture showing the number of marine repairs we've had in the last 10 years. The hot spots shown are there for different reasons. You've got off Japan, that was the earthquake, off tai, uh, Taiwan, again an earthquake, and Typhoon Morakot. Singapore is just the Malacca Strait, it mainly anchors, is a real problem in the Singapore Strait. The Middle East, you've got uh, Alexandria, where you had the uh, problem with two problems. One was a bunch of fishermen who decided to go and hunt for cables and cut them. Um, and the other one was an anchor that went through three different cables going into Alexandria and knocked out almost all of uh, the Middle East's internet. Further down the Middle East, you've got the issue in the Red Sea of piracy, together with the Somalia area. There's problems with piracy doing repairs there. And the other issue was a cable, uh, a large tanker actually in near Malta went through three or four cables without knowing about it. It just dropped its anchor in bad weather and just carried on going. But you can see the majority of the repairs in Europe are around the UK, shallow water, and in the Mediterranean, again, shallow water. A number of repairs across the Atlantic, not that many repairs across the Pacific, but again, a lot of repairs in the South China Seas caused mainly by fishing. So all these repairs, and they're caused by many different things, but so why so much maintenance? We've got a lot of ships around the world. Clam dredgers, mainly on the east coast of the United States, huge suction dredgers uh, catch the cable quite quickly and just they'll just cut it, and cut straight through it. Scallop dredgers, predominantly in the Irish Sea and the North Sea and in the east coast of the States and up into Canada. Again, those dredgers will just pick a cable up and I've got nice photographs of them actually stuck on the cable and they, they've just cut the whole dredge away and damaged the cable at the same time. Beam trawlers, uh, one of the worst in certainly in the North Sea, forever catching the cable. Large um, 6,000 horsepower trawlers, and there's nothing a cable can do, nothing we can do to bury the cable deep enough to stop these guys. They go down to about half a meter deep in sand. And having discussions with fishermen, I ask them and say, well, why, why do you fish over the cable? And they say, well, we've fished here for hundreds of years. And, yeah, fair enough use what you used 100 years ago then, and I'll be happy. But don't, don't use 6,000 horsepower trawlers. And they intentionally fish over cables, so it's not easy. Deep sea mining, not so much in the Atlantic yet. Certainly in the Indian Ocean, the Indians are going for uh, rare earth minerals in 4,000 plus meters of water. Um, it's going to come to the Atlantic, and it will eventually come to the Pacific as well once they get the technology to get these rare earth minerals up. They didn't know where they were going initially, and they have hit cables. Um, BP certainly did some drilling, um, actually for gas just off Australia, and wrapped 10 kilometers of telegraph cable around their drill bit, and it cost them a month's time to, take the bit, to clean the drill bit up. So knowing where the old cables are is quite useful, but deep sea mining is an issue at the moment. Theft. Uh, this is a Vietnamese boat which uh, stole a cable buoy, which is the yellow thing you can see there, um, from a repair. 
and also stole 200 kilometers of cable. Chopped it up, and they thought they were doing somebody a, a favor because they were going to get money in the market for it. Um, wasn't helped by the fact that the Vietnamese government actually asked them to do it. So there were slight issues there. But the theft is another issue, certainly in the South China Seas. Wind, wind farms, uh, not so much here yet, but certainly in the UK um, and around the UK, lots and lots of wind farms going in, becoming a very, very crowded seabed. They're getting in. We, we feel that they're getting in the way of the telecoms cables, and they just say the power cables, it's their choice to be able to put them there. But there's a lot of money in the green energy as well, so we have to look at it in two ways. Oil and gas, very prevalent in the North Sea and in the Gulf of Mexico, again, competing for the same bit of seabed as we are. Fish farms, um, more and more of them certainly in the, around the UK, again, competing for the same section of the seabed as we are. And the main threat that we find in the UK now are anchors. Um, a large, large anchor will go down probably a metre, and there's not much. If you've got a 200,000 ton ship, there's not much you can do about the anchor just going straight through the cable. So this is a picture um, from 1865, August the 5th, from the punch. Um, it's not very easy to read, but basically Neptune is saying to the mermaids, don't touch the cable, because that's how the last one got broken. Now, this was put in a magazine in the UK a month after the first transatlantic cable went in and failed. So I think some cartoonist had a, a bit of fun. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Elena for the next presentation. Hello. My name is Elena Badiola, and um, I work for Telefonica. Today we're going to talk about the lessons we've been learning the last 14 years since we started operations in South American One Cable, also known, we call it Sun One Cable. So we're going to first talk a bit about the topology and the logic diagrams and its history. Okay. Well, as Alasdair talked, we are constantly using Google Earth, and this is not free advertisement for them, but they have simplified our life a lot. So as you can see, um, someone is a ring that links North and South America, uh, connecting eight different countries using 14 different landing stations. So it connects the US to, down to Brazil on the East, on the Atlantic, and Argentina, we use a long haul to across the Andes to connect to Chile and up to Peru, Ecuador, Guatemala, crossing again using a terrestrial long haul across Guatemala, back to the US, and we have a festoon connecting Colombia as well. Okay, so someone started operations in December 2000. Its lifetime expectation, as Alasdair was talking about, was of 25 years, and when it was designed, Based on 10 gig technology, its maximum design capacity was of 1.92 terabits per second. Our current active capacity is of 4 terabits per second, and with our traffic forecast, by the end of this year, we will be getting to 5 terabits per second. We are currently starting with our yearly upgrade. So, because currently we're using 100 gig um, technology based on, on that speed, our current uh, design capacity is of 19. Dot, sorry, 19.2 terabits per second, and uh, the maximum water depth of the cable is up to 8,500 meters. So, let's talk about the history. In the late 90s, Telefonica Group was purchasing their uh, international capacity needs using consortium cables. And there was a team of people who were overlooking the IP needs to see how much capacity they needed to purchase. When they looked at the IP traffic forecast, they realized that they didn't have enough capacity to match their needs. So they decided very quickly to build their own cable. And then as Alasdair was talking about the legal process started, and well, there were six different countries involved with so many different regu um, regulations and permits, and that was a very intense part of the project. As well, they knew that some of the countries were not going to be part of the system at that time, but they decided 
to deploy strategically the branching units, which are basically signal dividers, signal and power dividers that allow the signal to go using two different paths to allow some traffic to just go through them and some other traffic to be dropped or added uh, connecting the coast. So they decided to deploy them strategically to allow future growth to different countries. And also the terrestrial links were key to the project because for Telefonica it was key to have a ring that could serve restore in the event of uh, an outage. This is um, our logical diagram. We have two rings, an outer ring composed by, it's formed by two fiber pairs. And as you can see, the branching units were, were, which are depicted as triangles in the diagram, allow the outer ring to go straight without dropping, for example, in Salvador in Brazil and just going straight so that the latency is better. And the inner ring, also formed by two fiber pairs, then in, that, in the inner ring, the traffic allows to be dropped and added in different points, in different landing stations. Um, as I was saying before, the branching units uh, allowed us to have extension in 2007 and connect Colombia, northern Peru, and Ecuador to our system because they were not uh, connected in 2000. Okay. The people who were involved in the design of this project had already uh, experience with consortium cables and they knew that they had to protect the weakest part of the system. And the weakest part of a submarine cable or a submarine system is not only shallow waters, but also especially the cable stations and the beach manholes and the landing cables from the beach manholes to the landing stations. So they did not um, design redundant beach manholes, but we do have redundant landing cables to, to link the cable stations and the beach manholes using different paths. These are just a couple slides um, showing the current capacity and the app and the design capacity and the different vendors we've been using in our yearly upgrades. So lessons we've learned about the design. Well, you know, fibers, that were built 15 years ago have happened to be very good for network upgrades. They are really working very well using 10 times as much capacity as they used to. Um, we think that they are because they use large core fibers and because the power density is lower than the, um, the nonlinear effects on the fiber are avoided. And this is key in segments that are very long as someone has. Also, if you build resilient buildings and landing cables, you avoid lots of maintenance problems. And we're talking here about corrective maintenance later that mean lots of money and time and dealing with angry customers. So it was key to do a, guide, a good site survey regarding the beaches and where the landing stations were gonna build. And yes, we've learned that terrestrial long holes are much more problematic because mud slides happen and car crashes happen and fires and um, also sabotage like in some parts of Guatemala, for example. And that fortunately the, the problems we've had with the wet plant have not been as usual. So let's talk now about preventive maintenance. So. As Alasdair was talking before, the wet plant outages are caused mainly by three reasons. First, third parties, then earthquakes, and abrasion. Well, you can't avoid earthquakes, but you can deal with abrasion in some way, and we will talk about it later. So we, what we try to do is to minimize the outages that are caused by third parties. And to do so, we carry out what we call cable awareness campaigns in which some um, people, a company representing our interests, holds meetings with other parties involved in the uh, marine resources, such as fishermen's associations and ship owners, and gas and oil companies and governmental organizations. So in these meetings, we try to make them aware of the location of our cables, and we find out some, uh, especially with gas, gas and oil companies, future, future crossings to our cable. These two pictures uh, are part of a project that we had in 2010 in which um, 
gas company wanted to build a duct crossing our cable. So what we did to, to allow this crossing was that they built the, like these two huge Lego pieces that were placed by them parallel to our cable so that the duct would be laid on top of those Lego pieces and then there was a meter be between their duct and our cable. And that was a success because it was, that was performed in 2010 and we haven't had a problem since so. These are other examples uh, of the cable awareness campaigns. We um, give out flyers with the locations of our systems and they like to be very practical so they carry these pieces of cable to show the ship owners that cables can be very easily trapped by their fishing gear and as Alasdair was mentioning before, they have to abandon their fishing gear if they think they got a cable, uh, mostly because of their security, like you don't want to be handling with a cable that is fed up to 4,000 volts, or I wouldn't like to. And, and so if they abandon it, then they show the cable owner that they had to abandon the fishing gear, then the cable owner has to pay for it. So we've all always had uh, some problems of cable exposures in some of the, in certain beaches of the, of the system. So we carried out some topographic studies some years ago just to try to understand the reasons why we were having recurrent exposures so that we could uh, address them either on our own or with third parties such as local um, governments. Um, we also carried an inspection by some divers, post deployment inspection two years ago to see how the, to observe the cable 10 years after having been uh, deployed. And with the conclusions of these actions that were, of course, were not cheap. I think we spent like a million dollars doing that. But we could address and we could redefine uh, what we call the risk management chart to know where, where our cable is weak or weaker and we can do, we can take action plans to decrease the risk. Telephonic also belongs to International Cable Protection Committee, and that committee tries to make, we're part of the executive committee, we try to make aware the governments, for example, of the importance of the international cables for their economies and for their communications as key infrastructure to the, to the economy. Okay. This is the chart I was talking about. This is updated every year with the input of the cable awareness campaigns, the, our landing station managers, our um, maintenance providers, our operations team, so that, and you can see there that there are different colors representing minor to major and very high risk, so that we can then design action plans in order to address these issues. Let's talk about corrective maintenance. So, we've had eight outages in our wind plant in the 14 years. Two of them were caused by earthquakes. Uh, other two were, co uh, were caused by abrasion on the coast of Brazil because it was a very rocky seabed. And what happened was that with time and sea current, the cable was constantly being rubbed to the rocky seabed and then it was eroded until a shunt fault happened. And I will come to what a shunt fault is a bit later on. In the second repair, we decided that maybe if we change the kind of cable that we were using and substitute it by a more resilient one, then we could address this problem. And it was a good decision because we haven't had any other shunt fault in the area in the last seven years, touching wood now. And then the last four outages were caused by third parties. We had a big problem in an area between Argentina and Uruguay because of the ship trawlers, fish trawlers, sorry, and because of the cable awareness campaigns and maybe because we also sued the companies that damaged our cables in the last two times and they had to pay millions of dollars, then we haven't had a problem in that area, touching wood again, uh, for the last five years. So these are examples of two shunt faults. What happens is that there's a polyethylene layer that isolates the copper layer that the submarine cables have. 
And the copper layer is basically to feed uh, the active elements uh, that are part of the system, such as the branching units that I used before, and the that I mentioned before, and the power, and the repeaters, and the uh, gain equalizer units. So. What happens is that with time, it gets eroded until the copper layer gets in contact with the ground, with the seabed, and then poof, spark, and it just gets burned. So picture on the right, I was walking around doing some training in our maintenance provider facilities. And sometimes they just have some scrap cables over there for their training purposes. And there was a very large piece of cable, and I went to have a look, and actually it was our scrap cable from one of our repairs. And you can see in the outer layer how it was filleted because of the fishing gear. This was caused by a, by a ship. And you can see that they actually did a huge hole in it. So that's what a shunt fault is. So we are part of a private agreement. We have three ships, one based in Curacao also in Western Atlantic and two based in the Eastern part one in Calais and one in Cape Verde. We did this, we used to be part of a concession, but they can sometimes be complicated, and what moved us was basically to save some money. What we have with these ships is we have some critical spurs on board, so that whenever we need to call them out because we're in trouble, then we can avoid the two days that it would take them to go to port and load all the spurs in order to do the repair. Because when you're in trouble, you, you, know, you just want to get to cable grounds and start repairing as soon as possible. So some, this is the most painful lesson we learned, I think. We had a repair in 2010, and it was a 5,500 meter depth outage. So what happened there was that we, this, the strategy of the repair, we got it wrong from the beginning. So you know how you dress it uh, in this kind of, of uh, water depths, it, it is very, very rustic. You have some grapnels, and you're just plowing the seabed with the grapnels until you find the cable, and you pull it, and, and you can then start repairing. So what happened was that whenever we started to deploy the grapnels to the seabed, by the time, because of the water, the, that by the time that the grapnel hit or got to the seabed, we had already shipped, like we were sailing already above the cable, so we were just missing it, missing it all the time. And whenever you do one of these drives, we call it a holding drive or a cutting drive, and with these water depths, one drive can take up to 20 hours. So you're basically waiting to see if you were lucky, looking at some tension that the, like that the grapnel is holding, you know, like to see if you grabbed it or not, and then you have your manager, like, did you grab it? I don't know, we have to wait for 14 more hours. How can this be true? Isn't this 21st century? Well, I don't know. Well, yes, this is very, very interesting. So we basically missed one week trying to find where the cable was. It was buried because it had, uh, there had been an earthquake, so there was a mudslide, and it was just buried. Not, not a very nice month of my life. So this is a list of all the repairs, of all the tasks that are involved in a repair. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but just let me tell you, if your cable owner tells you um, best case scenario is that a, Deep water repair is going to take you no less than four or five days. It's, and that is the best case scenario, because you have to test it. And it is a very delicate and rustic technique. And you know what? This is man versus nature. So you are in the sea. And you are depending on the wind and, in, and on the sea. And if the sea is rough, you just have to wait until the sea is, uh, allows you to, to keep on with the repair. And if the wind is blowing and, and it is not safe, you have to stop and wait. Well, when is the sea going to be better? Uh, well, so weather forecasts are very important, you know, when it comes to a, to, a, to a repair. So some pictures now. This is our cable depot in Curacao, and that's where our cable, our 
spare cable is stored and some spare kits in order to perform the, the splices. Hey, <laughs> so remember that one on the, the one in, in the upper row, first column, first row, that's a cutting grapnel. And that's the one that you start plowing and then it gets, if you're lucky, it gets trapped. The cable gets trapped there. It has some weights. Uh, in the, before the grapnel, there are some weights and it, depending on the seabed, you uh, choose the, the, you choose what grapnels you're gonna be using so to increase the chance of finding the cable, you know, and yeah, 5,500 meters, this cable, 5,500 meters down in the sea. So it is not easy. So these are um, pictures of initial and final splices, and these can take from 12 hours on because uh, humidity and temperature are key. They're, they have to be very accurate, and then you have to do again all the isolation on top of the copper layer, and you have to avoid bubbles over, very important, and, you have, and then they have their own x-ray machine to take x-ray pictures of the splice, and this takes from 12 hours on, and then you have to test it. So believe me, this is why, this is one of the reasons why the water super takes so long. ROV operations, well, if the depth of the water is below 2,000 meters and the wind allows you and the sea conditions allow you, then you can use um, the remote operated vehicles. And this can make your life easier because it helps you. They have cameras and they help you to find where the cable is easier. But they are also very delicate machinery and they, they usually break down. That happens. <laughs> so representatives on board, we send people to the cable ships to overview the repair. That's me on the left. Uh, I was on board five years ago now for five weeks uh, because there was an earthquake in Honduras and there were, we were part of ACMA back in the day and there were three different cable systems that were damaged by the earthquake. So I was lucky enough to enjoy a cruise in the Caribbean paid for my, by my company f for five weeks. Me and 57 guys. <laughs> It was not as much fun as you would think, and it was not as luxurious as you would expect, believe me. After three weeks, there were, the food started to run out. Yeah, it was an adventure. And last but not least, our future challenges. So, you know, even before considering building another cable, you want to make the most of the one you have. So we try different, we try new technologies. So we have tested lately, 200 gigabits per second wavelength uh, live on our system. And the test went good. And we also tried gridless WDM. And that will allow us to uh, decrease the space between the wavelengths from 50 gigahertz to 33, so that this, um, the capacity of our system will increase. And this was also a good test. It, it was successful. So Unisur. Um, this is something to be proud of. Uh, you know, cable systems, uh, life lifespan is about 25 years, and Unisur started operations 20 years ago, and it was already decommissioned, and it links um, Argentina and Uruguay and, and Brazil. But we decided, why don't we give it a go? And they tested it, and they saw that the fibers were okay, so we decided to bring it back to life, and um, it's, it has been repurposed, and it's gonna be back in operation later this year, and we'll see how much, time, how much more time we can have it living, you know, and the initial capacity for it's gonna be 200 gigabit per second. And last but not least, um, our PCCS cable that is currently being built, and it will link um, North, uh, the U.S. and Puerto Rico, uh, Tortola, Aruba, um, Colombia, Panama, across Panama, down to Ecuador. So that will allow us to have diverse connections to 
Puerto Rico and the US and Colombia and Ecuador. And you know, for us, it is key to have two connections to its country, to sleep better at night when we're in trouble and to have a much more resilient solution so that we can be prepared for when, when, yeah, when we have problems. So um, this was my presentation and now we have some time for questions and, and answers. Hi, uh, Maurice Dean from Facebook. Um, uh, just a quick question, the new PCCS uh, system, uh, what's the initial capacity? Oh, sorry, oh, what, what's the initial capacity of the uh, PCCS system? We are currently deploying 100 gigabit per second technology using it, and the initial capacity is of, um, I, I can't remember the figure right now, but if you give me your email, I will send you the response, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, thanks. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much.